so welcome everybody uh, to this seminar, which is part of the program of the Institute for Global Health Innovation. Um, it's a Thursday afternoon seminar, which we have on the third, third Thursday of every month. Um, and the idea of these is to bring together people in different parts of Imperial to discuss issues around global health trying to bring together people from different departments who wouldn't otherwise naturally talk to each other. Um, so today we have a topic on health and cities and air pollution, uh, and we have a nice diverse group of people talking from different parts of the college, looking at very different areas in which uh, the college is working on this particular problem. Uh, sadly, uh, Dr. Fang is uh, unwell, so we're going to have one fewer uh, talks that we were scheduled to have, but that's fine. We, we have still a very strong uh, program. Uh, the uh, program, as I say, is uh, supported by the Institute of Global Health Innovation, and I'm very <coughs> glad to, uh, uh, to thank uh, Nikita and Joe and the rest of the team for putting this on. So, without any ado, uh, we'll have the first talk, which is now going to be gi given by Andrea Calderon Erozok. And she is here, and uh, she works in health policy, I think. Yeah. And, uh, we'll be, and we'll be talking about transport and cities. So, welcome. Um, now, I should just say that this is being, I. I forgot to say this because I didn't really understand what it means, but it, this is being live streamed, <laughs> so everything is being broadcast to the world. It's also being live tweeted, so um, whatever that means, it's being live tweeted, so you may get questions via Joe halfway through, um, but just be aware, and when we come to questions, we'll hand out the um, microphone, because otherwise people on the live tweet won't be able to hear you, but if you'd like to come um, and set up. So, Andrea, you can put that round your neck. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I'm Andrea Calderon. I work at CEP, that is the Center for Environmental Policy in Imperial. Um, and my research is about evaluating low carbon mobility strategies in cities, assessing the impacts for greenhouse gas reductions, air pollution control, and the, the impacts on health. My supervisors uh, that you uh, may be familiar with them, is Dr. Audrey Denassel and Professor Helena Simon. So just to start a bit with the motivation of my research, uh, here we have a plot with the global burden of the seas in 2010. So the impact of different health problems uh, due to the 20 uh, leading risk factors we have here. And as you can see highlighted in red, we have particulate matter, pollution, and physical inactivity as the top nine and top 10 uh, risk factors in the world. So definitely it's a major problem. And I think we have to focus and tackle air pollution as an opportunity. So assessing the co-benefits of um, air pollution control and quantifying the, the co-benefits, I think is, is the way we should go. Here I'm presenting a table from a very interesting research by James Woodcock some years ago. And what they did was to develop different scenarios in Delhi and, and London to assess the health benefits. And here you can see that um, in a scenario where walking and cycling were highly promoted in London, the, the health benefits were huge. So five more than 500 uh, premature deaths saved by, per, per million population in London. And of course, in cities like Delhi, where, where like 
really air pollution uh, problems, then uh, the health benefits of low carbon emissions, vehicle fleet and mobility are, are greater. So just to, to focus on my research, the aim of my project is to find synergies and uh, understand how can we maximize synergies and, and minimize trade-offs in the analysis of mobility in cities for climate action, air pollution control, and health at the city level. So today I'll be presenting some of my uh, modeling emissions results. Basically, for the London case study, what I did was to first define different scenarios, so mapping current and future mobility strategies in London, ambitious and not so ambitious policies, and then I used those as scenarios as inputs for the emissions modeling. I used uh, the UK integrated assessment model that is a, made a, a, a model developed in Imperial by Professor Helena Simon, widely used by DEFRA, and it's a model that captures the transport dynamics at the city level, so you can uh, model different strategies. And now um, I'm not going to present my results for the health impact modeling, but actually I'm using James Woodcock, Woodcock's uh, model, the TIGDAC model, to analyze those emissions scenarios as inputs in the, in the health modeling. So I'll go very quickly through the scenarios that I model. Of course, I use a baseline. My projections were uh, till 2030. I have three different areas of study. So central London, inner London, and greater London. So each of my scenarios were run in these three different areas of London. Today, I'll, I will just be presenting my results for inner London due to time constraints. And then within my scenarios, I had two main categories technological innovation scenarios, and then model shift scenarios. So those are scenarios that are required a behavioral change. Within the technological innovation scenarios, I uh, model the different strategies, for example, the ultra low emission zone that is gonna be implemented in London in 2019. Uh, there are mobility strat strategies focusing in uh, exhaust emission standards, so Euro standards. Then I model different vehicle fleet electrification because, as you may know, uh, measures that we can and TFL G, uh, and GLA have an extremely ambitious project and technological strategy to electrify basically the entire fleet in London. So first they'll start with taxis in central London, then buses in central London, and then they want to expand to inner London to achieve in 2050 a zero emissions uh, city in London. And then I just um, analyzed a current trend in the UK, a fuel switch between petrol and diesel cars. So for the first time in the last 20 years, we're seeing in the UK an increase of petrol cars. And I model this to see the environmental impacts of, of this trend. Then in the behavioral change or model shift scenarios, I use, uh, I model car trip reduction. So uh, using less cars to move around city, around London. And then um, I model the cycle lanes. So the cy cycle superhighways that have been built in London and they plan to expand them. I model them as um, using traffic flow reduction on those cycle paths. Um, so here I, are my results for emissions. Later I'll show you the concentrations results. That those are the ones that you use for the health impact modeling. For, but for emissions, here are my NOx emissions results. So the first column is the baseline in, the tw in 2030. And each different color is a different fleet composition. So the green uh, color are diesel cars, the blue one are petrol cars, etc. Here are the technological strategies. So this second column is the ultra low emission zone. And then I have here three different um, electrification strategies. So the first one is electrifying taxis, then electrifying buses, and then electrifying the entire fleet, again, in inner London. Then uh, the fuel switch, so switching from diesel to petrol, and on the behavioral strategies, the model shift strategies, 
I have here a range of reduction between 10 and 50 reduction in car use in inner London and then the cycle superhighways. So as you can see, the strategy with the largest reduction for NOx emissions is the electrif electrification of the vehicle fleet in, in inner London. So um, it's important to mention that these technological strategies, they do have, of course, a health impact because the exposure of the people, because you are reducing air pollution, will be lower. But these uh, behavioral strategies have another additional health benefit, that is the physical activity one. Um, these are my results for NOx. And then I did the same for PM10 and PM2.5. Here I'm presenting the PM10. And here's a completely different story from the NOx, because here I am assessing exhaust and non-exhaust emissions. So while having an electric car will have zero exhaust emissions, you still have the non-exhaust emissions with electrification. So the tire wear and the, and the brake wear, the electric cars, they still have them. And the, the PM projections in 2030, 2050 by TFL, GLA, and by my modeling uh, estimates that uh, from the total PM emissions, more than 20% are non-exhaust emissions. So because the technology innovation is very high in the following decades, the, 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 the PM emissions mainly are, are non-exhaust. So the only way to reduce those non-exhaust emissions are by taking a car out, out of the street. So here that's why the behavioral strategies on the right side are the, the ones with the largest reduction of of PM emissions. So the reduction of 10% of cars uh, or the re reduction of 50% of cars in inner London will have a reduction between 2 and 10% of, of the PM emissions in, in London. And then I also integrated the climate action. So the CO2 part of the story that is usually seen completely apart from air pollution, and I do think that we have to find synergies to tackle those two problems at the same time. And a major problem with the uh, electrification, for, for example, for the technological strategies, is the emissions produced during the production of electricity. That are not emissions uh, emitted in London, but are emissions emitted in the power plants. So I added those CO2 emissions, and those are the gray, the light gray and the dark gray bars at the top of each scenario. And as you can see, for the vehicle fleet electrification in inner London, that if we were not accounting for the CO2 emissions in the electricity uh, process, generation process, uh, we'll have something, a reduction as ambitious as the one for NOx. But here, because I'm counting the electricity production, is only a reduction of 14%. Um, I have uh, two ranges of electricity production. So the low and the high, they correspond to the highest and the lowest carbon intensity in the electricity production in, in the UK in the last 20 years. Um, and now, for the most important par part for health, health impact assessment model, modeling is the concentration. So here I'll, I'll just present my baseline of NOx. Again, in 2030, um, it's at the watt level in London. And the very dark red watts that you see are NOx, uh, watts with NOx levels above 40 micrograms per, per cubic meter. And as you may know, the, the limit of the World Health Organization, not for NOx, but for NO2, is 40. So we're, um, we want to be below that limit. And of course, is the, higher, the highest concentrations are completely correlated with where the roads in London are. So here we have the North Circular and the South Circular Road, and they correspond with the areas of, of highest air pollution. This is the baseline. Those are absolute numbers of concentrations. And what I did for all of my scenarios was to measure the reduction. So the benefits 
that um, each strategy would have in terms of reduction of, of concentrations per ward in London. So here are only the reductions con concentrations. This map is the ultra low emission zone. Um, the darkest blue are values between 1 and 50 micrograms per square meter, reductions again, not absolute values. And then here we have, for example, the uh, electrification of taxis in inner London. And just to compare these two uh, scenarios, uh, when you quantify the administrative um, process of implementing, for example, the ultra low emission zone, where you have to verify the EU standard of, of each vehicle entering uh, inner London, while comparing with just electrifying the taxi fleet, in the most polluted area in London, that is central London, by electrifying only the taxis, you can see greater reductions. So this is when you have to assess the trade-offs between um, one strategy that may seem very, say, very promising, but implementing actually tackling the problem in that area by electrifying the taxis, uh, you get more, uh, a, larger, a larger reduction. And here at the bottom, I have um, the 50% car reduction in inner London. As you can see, the reduction is huge. The purple wards are reductions of 14 micrograms per square meter. And then the, electrif the electrification of the vehicle fleet in inner London is by far the, the one with the largest, with the largest reductions. However, these are the inputs for the health impact modeling. And if well, the vehicle elect electrification and the car reduction will have uh, a lot of health benefits because of the reduction of exposure of people living and working in inner London, only this car reduction scenario will have physical activity um, health benefits. Because I'm so a person will stop using the car and then will take the transport, the public transport, or walk, or cycle, or will cycle to to work or to commute. So this is the first part of my project, uh, doing the emissions uh, modeling, and then all of these scenarios are going to be used, and I'm currently using them to as inputs for the health impact assessment. So I'd like to conclude with the importance that is to deeply assess with a broad perspective all the policies. And from my results, I can see that policies promoting electrification of the vehicles, they have to be paired with, with, with policies to change the behavior of, of people living in London. So stop using the car just to uh, drive to the supermarket that is two blocks away from, from your home, etc. Um, thank you. That's really interesting. Now we have time for a few uh, uh, Question? questions now. Okay. Uh, we'll have more time at the end for a more general discussion. But um, yeah, in the meantime, anybody who has to go to seat, if you could move in a little bit. Um, doing what all the students who guard the entrances to the seats. Uh, okay. So, yes. Um, thank you very much for your work. Um, Sadiq Khan, the Lord Mayor, or the Mayor, is pushing the ULEZ, um, which the previous incumbents was against. Yeah. But it seems that that's really a very, it's not a good strategy at all. Um, can you please try to um, change the prevailing view as soon as possible, otherwise we can add it. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, it's, as you can see here, it's not the, the best way to go. But I think it's a good start, like to promote, uh, yeah, like conscious around, around the people in a way. And yeah, definitely it's, it's not the best strategy. Also because it's based on exhaust standards, and we know that real world emissions, so the actual emissions of every car, do not correspond with Euro standards. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's not the best one. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much.
very much. And related to that, can you comment on how um, you could model or here are the uh, effect of using multiple strategies at once? So if you were to do a little bit of uh, car reduction and then some implementation of fleet uh, electric, what would be the combined effect or which would be uh, ideal? Because we wouldn't target one intervention. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, the main problem with implementing policies from health, from the health aspect, climate and policy, is that many times the ministries are, are divided, so they do not work together. And for example, in the climate uh, and CO2 part of the problem, energy people do not talk with air pollution people, so I think the main point is to get together and try to see one strategy from from every perspective. I think that's the, the, the main solution. So uh, sit together, all the ministers, and, and work together. I think that's the main barrier when, when doing it. I was a little bit surprised at how little effect it had, actually, some of your interventions on the air pollution levels. Yes. Is that surprising to you? Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's very surprising, for example, the ultra-low emission zone. And, it, and very surprising the, when, when you're analyzing the PM 2.5, for example, that is uh, extremely uh, important for health. When you are electrifying your fleet, and if your aim is to electrify the fleet, you are not solving the problem because yeah. you still have those, those non-exhaust emissions that, that will be still there. So I think it's, it's very important to, to analyze uh, the problem from all the perspectives. Yeah, which may also explain why actually you get more health benefit from increasing people's mobility than you do from a local uh, effect on, on traffic. Yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah, because okay. if the, you, you do not have an, an extra vehicle in the streets and the people is yeah. physical active, so, right. yeah. So we all have to do our shopping by on foot. <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so next we have one Pablo, who has a nice job. He seems to spread himself between London, Barcelona, and Antwerp. <laughs> must be good. And his photograph has him in Tomquad in Oxford. So <laughs> quite, maybe he spent the rest of his time on holiday. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you're going to talk to us a little bit about um, um, <coughs> carbon uh, modeling. Yes. That, that's right. Well, thank you. Yes. I don't know if my life is as exciting as you make it sound, but <laughs> <laughs> it's been some exciting um, three, three years, I think. Um, so, yes, I am Juan Pablo Orjuela. I am a PhD student at the Center for Environmental Policy with Andrea also. Um, my original title said predicting black carbon intake in an active population using limited primary data, so I apologize to any black carbon enthusiasts out there, but I'll still be talking about black carbon, but um, I included some results on PM 2.5 also, so that's why I changed the title. Um, and as I go through the presentation that hopefully I won't take more than the time that I have, let me put this thing on or else I'm sure I will spend more time talking than I'm supposed to. Um, as I go through this, uh, I, I would like you to have in mind these guiding questions that will also help me to, to guide a little bit of the context that I want to give to the rest of the presentation. So the first question is, is an analysis based on air pollutant concentrations enough? So, and the reason why I think that this is a, an interesting question is because coming from um, the air pollution science, we, when we're modeling, we tend to model a lot in terms of the concentration and sometimes we even take it to the exposure level, so ambient concentrations or exposure concentrations of air pollutants. Um, and we try very hard to get those concentrations right. So we create smaller meshes and we create more um, significant uh, variables to add into our models and we have land use regression models and then we use uh, the meteorology to make dispersion models. But n normally we stop there in the concentration either from ambient concentrations or exposure concentrations and hopefully by the end of the presentation I'll make the case for why we have to go a bit further. Uh, another interesting question is what, what role does transport play in daily exposures in inhaled doses? So 
Uh, and the first part of this question is focusing on transport, and just transport is like a particular interest of mine in my research. Um, but it's accounting for the concentration exposures when you are in transport has with it a lot of complex uh, interactions. Um, so you have people that are moving in different routes, in different modes, different times of the day, and that brings so much difficulty to the entire process. And sometimes you think to yourself, well, all of this hassle for less than an hour trip in a 24-hour day, is this really going to make a difference? And again, I hope that by the end of the presentation I make a case that it is. Um, and then we go to the step that I believe that it's important to take further, which is moving from concentrations into inhaled doses. Um, and um, research until now, I think, has not been giving enough attention to this particular um, problem of modeling ventilation rates uh, within people um, in order to, to get into inhalation uh, doses of the different pollutants. And one of the reasons why we don't do this is because, well, doing this for big populations is not normally affordable. So having all of these wearable devices until very recently uh, used to be a very expensive process. So, <clears throat> um, but of course, out in the literature, you find really interesting job, uh, really interesting research, like uh, this one from James Smith from um, King's College. They have a wonderful um, dispersion model, and they, on top of that dispersion model, they have modeled how people move with origin and destination and what trips do they do and what um, modes do they use and this is absolutely so this is what they call the hybrid model where you have both of those components playing in, into into one so the dispersion of air pollution and you have how people are moving in that dispersion in that pollution cloud let's say um, and then other researchers um, have done have recognizing the importance of transport in all of this have said, well, why don't we compare between modes? So they have, um, they measure uh, different pollutants concentrations using um, in the same route in the, at the same time, but you do it either cycling or in a car, and you compare the concentrations there, and you recognize that there is a difference between the ambient pollutions and the exposure pollu uh, uh, concentrations, and those exposure concentrations will depend on your mode. So with Audrey, my supervisor, uh, we did this, uh, and Olivier, we did this. Um, a quantitative review of all of those concomitant measurements of, of air pollution and figured out for Europe some, some ratios that you could use to fix that um, from ambient pollution to exposure concentrations. And if you consider that, that step from ambient pollution to whatever mode you are, then you can start modeling, okay, I know I can model how people move, I can model the exposure out there, and now I can model the ratio to correct for, that, for, for the different modes that you're using. And then they did this, um, Lena Sel and her uh, uh, collaborators did this uh, modeling in, uh, for Barcelona, uh, where they had GPS data of different people, about 50 people, I think. Um, and they, they monitored them and they um, modeled the exposures for the different modes. But then uh, Dons and her collaborators um, also decided to do some black carbon measurements in different transport modes, but this time instead of uh, of instead of modeling, they're measuring, and instead of being concomitant, they are just having a free living population and measuring the differences between car users and cyclists, for example. So now you can actually account for what's happening in their entire day, and you can still have people in the different modes that they normally use, but now you can see what the effect of mode is in the entire day. Um, so back to my questions. Um, so Evie Dons, uh, they highlight and her collaborators, they highlight the importance of including the inhaled doses. That's why they measured black carbon inside the different transport modes to show that when you go into inhaled doses, it makes a whole, it paints the, the, the picture differently. Um, then Asel and her, her collaborators also showed that although you're spending only less than an hour in transport, uh, uh, in a day or maybe even up to two hours, that 6% more or less that is what you're spending in transport will account for out to, up to 20% of the total inhaled dose in your day because you're exposed to higher concentrations and you're having higher inhalation doses. That 20% of course being for active travelers, so pedestrians and cyclists. Um, so we could use this hybrid modeling, uh, like the one that uh, Smith and, and his collaborators have, have developed at King's, but then you would definitely have to include the variable of inhaled dose to see the process, um, the, the differences between them. Um, 
So, but until now, there, none of these studies have included everything, like the ideal amount of variables that you would like to include. It's uh, like a broad scale that can be applicable to a bigger population, uh, but using measured data uh, and including inhaled dose, and this is mainly because of costs. So what have we done till now? One of the things that we did in terms of modeling is, as I was just saying, you could start with, um, with a dispersion model. This is a dispersion model of Barcelona, and you can, have, you can give people uh, smartphones, or you could eventually use uh, the data that they have on their smartphones all the time, but like, getting to those data is not that easy. So you give them a smartphone, and you collect the data from your, your own smartphone. And that's easier to, to handle in terms of, um, of data. Uh, and you know, and you ask them what mode they're using, and you ask them if they were indoors or, or outdoors. You use ratios like the ones we developed for those. Um, and you can correct for the hour and the day because you have that information from, from the background stations. And then you have your personal exposure to air pollution. And the good thing about smartphones is, besides that everyone has them, is that um, they also have an accelerometer. So you can actually estimate the physical activity that they're doing at the time, at, the, at that exact uh, moment. And with the physical activity levels, you can um, estimate the ventilation rates, and then you can take it to, um, to the inhaled dose. So this was very, a very interesting um, job uh, work that we did. And I think we, I could spend a lot of time talking about this. But here in this table, um, what I want to, to highlight, let's say, is that um, I, the, the numbers are the um, geometric mean. And the ones in brackets are the standard uh, geometric standard deviation. Uh, so as you can look, if you look at uh, the transport line, you'll see that although people are spending 112 minutes per day in average versus the 874 while, while indoors or working or at home or at a friend's or something, um, at the end in the last column in inhaled dose, you can see that the inhaled doses for uh, transport are three times as much as the ones indoors. So this is one of the reasons why transport is so important. And if you look into the detail of transport, you'll see the different modes. And again, I invite you to look at the line from cyclists. And there you can see that cyclists are actually, uh, besides the ones that are using the bus, but that's, they are spending the, 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 the less time while in transport, but at the same time, their inhaled dose is the, um, the biggest one. So they, while in transport, they're spending, uh, um, they're inhaling a lot of, of uh, PM 2.5 in this case. This is our PM, PM 2.5 results. Um, but of course, this is a little bit like cheating because we have ratios that we've used. So we've assigned different ratios for every mode. So it's like a mathematical trick. So the first question was, how big of an influence is this mathematical trick? What happens when, instead of using a fixed number, we do a Monte Carlo analysis over those ratios? And then you would get results like this. Instead of numbers, you get bars. Um, but as you can see, there's a clear distinction, even when you do the Monte Carlo analysis for between minimum and maximum that you see in the literature, you still see clear distinctions between the modes. So clearly, cyclists um, are inhaling much more um, in this case, PM 2.5 while in transport. But again, all of this is while in transport. So does this have an influence in your daily, in your daily uh, life, let's say, in your total inhaled dose for, for the day? Um, so I have the physical activity at, in the top, um, PM 2.5 concentrations in the middle, and inhaled dose at the end. And I've uh, just uh, mentioned the, the, the test, the, the, the ANOVA test that we did for those different um, uh, exposures and, uh, and inhalations. And we've seen that they are significant even when you look at so for the entire day. So if you look at the differences between the, inhale, the average inhaled dose for an entire day and you group people by the mode that they normally use, you still see that there is a significant difference. So again, you're just spending one or two, maximum two hours in transport, but those two hours are being key to explain your total day of inhaled dose. So back to the questions. So of course, concentrations are not, in, uh, are not enough. I guess this suggests how important inhaled dose is. Um, and on average, we're finding something similar to what uh, Denacel and Dons have found in, in the past. Um, so when you look only at concentrations in the different travel modes, uh, active transport people will not be particularly uh, affected, let's say, if you're only looking at the concentration, because the concentration levels while, while you're cycling could be lower than when you are in a bus or in, in a car. But if you include inhalation rates, that's when you start seeing the difference. That's the importance. 
Uh, and finally, um, just all the results that I've shown you until now are very modeled, let's say, instead of um, really collecting data from, from real life. So what did we do next? Uh, we did a very similar process, but here in London and in Barcelona and also in Antwerp. Uh, but in not only giving them the phone and the GPS and the uh, sensor to have their physical activity levels, but also a microthalometer, which is the blue one on top, uh, to measure the black carbon concentrations that they were exposed to. And when you include this, this is a, this is a graph that may, it, at the beginning it has too much information, but I'll, I'll still try to um, make clear what I want to say with this, with this graph. So um, you have the different modes. You have a daily inhaled a black carbon <coughs> doses for your entire day in the y-axis. Um, and the bars are the results of that inhaled dose. So you can see just by looking at the bars, let's say that, for example, uh, in the, the, that's the result for Barcelona and this is the result for London. Um, so you can see that there are some differences uh, between the different modes in their, in their median. You can see, for example, that um, pedestrian cycle and vehicle have something similar. This, we've left it unknown, but uh, there's just a, you could kind of um, assume that that's when they are in the tube, but the results there um, are not very um, reliable, let's say. So let's just concentrate on bicycle, pedestrian, and vehicle, and then the differences between those medians are significant. So again, in real life, we're still seeing that. Uh, and every bubble is uh, a measurement that ends in, the, in those boxes, but then the size of the bubble is the amount of physical activity that they're doing, and the color of the bubble is the concentration that they're exposed to. Uh, and you see cases where it's very clear, for example, on this stop one here and the, the vehicle up here, uh, these are people that are basically exposed to very high black carbon concentrations, that's why their inhalation they, they rates are so high. But something that I think is very interesting is looking, for example, at this cyclist here uh, that uses the cycle for most of for, for most of the of the of the travel choices he has, he or she has. Um, but his concentra the concentration that that this participant is exposed to are not that high. They're not on the on the dark red one. Um, but still, his the, the inhalation rates are much higher than people that are exposed to other concentrations. Uh, but since the bubble is big, that means it's doing a lot of physical exercise, then the total inhalation rate is, is, is quite high. So the message that I want to kind of come across with this, with this graph here is um, how since we've been focusing all of our policies and legislation and recommendations in terms of uh, concentrations, um, we as modelers in air pollution, we tend to go to concentrations as the last step that we want to see. But when you include inhalation rates, you see that people that have similar concentrations uh, can have very different inhalation rates. And that means basically that the way that air pollution is affecting their health is very, very different. So right now, basically, we're saying that this person is like in the modeling that we have right now, we, we care more about these kinds of people that are exposed to very high concentrations more than this one, for example, that is exposed to, to, to less than the, the recommendation, but still the inhalation rates are very high. So this is like kind of um, not very good for active travelers specifically um, that could, could be exposed to less concentrations, but will be inhaling a lot of, 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 of pollutants. And finally, the next step is how do we bring this to uh, a large population? So that's, that's what we're working on right now. We have measuring those microthalometer uh, data for everyone is not going to be cheap. So one of our hypotheses is what if we have surveys and we decide which are the questions that we can ask to the population to get to know their behavior much better and get to estimate their, their physical activity levels better. And that way we can correlate um, their inhalation rates to their behavior. And doing those kinds of um, surveys is going to be much cheaper. So just having a, sam a small sample of people using microthalometers combined with a big survey, you could have a much, much better uh, indication of the health impacts of air pollution in your city. And that, that's it. Thank you very much. So this is open to
questions. Um, perhaps I can start. How do you see this as being mostly used as a research tool or as a policy tool? Um, well, I. The the honest answer is our research. The like the optimist part of my of me wants to say a policy um, tool, and the reason why I. The reason why I see this as a policy tool is because of what I was just saying at the end. Um, policies have been focusing on concentrations, uh, and that has disproportionately affected the different populations in our cities. So active populations, um, active travelers, which are basically not, a, they're, 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 con they're, they're not contributing to the problem, but, but they're still disproportionately receiving part of the cost. Um, so if you manage to change that in, in policy, it's definitely a, a, a good idea. And that's also a case for building much better cycle infrastructure, uh, um, a case for building much better pedestrian infrastructure, a way of still promoting physical activity, but in a way that you promote those, those, those people, but um, th those uh, behaviors. But at the same time, it's a little bit difficult to get to a point where you can say, well, Instead of regulating for how much is the recommendation level for uh, concentrations, we're going to have a new uh, recommended level for average inhaled dose in a day. So regulating for that is going to be absolutely absurd. So that's why the real researcher in me says, no, it's actually a more researcher tool. All right. Well, maybe we can come back to that to base that at the end. Maybe uh, we'll get other views. Any other questions on this particular? As I say, we'll come back at the end to a more general discussion. But thank you very much indeed. For yep. that. Thank you. So the next speaker is Dr. Lowe, who is in the Department of Surgery. A bit surprising for somebody. Uh, he's an expert on measuring things. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you should be here already. Right, first of all, thanks for uh, inviting me to, to give a talk. Yes, I'm in the Department of Surgery and Cancer, uh, but my, work, uh, my background is engineering. So um, you may not hear anything about surgery today. Um, um, <coughs> and my research focus is mainly on wearable uh, sensors uh, for health. So uh, for the last uh, few years, uh, I have a few students uh, which uh, uh, we start looking to can we use some of the technology we develop into helping us to understand our own health. Um, so probably you you are all aware that uh, although like in in China, India, uh, air pollution is a major problem, but even London we are facing a major major air pollution problem. Uh, Oxford Street is the most polluted place on earth, uh, founded by King's College a few years ago, um, and bring us to a question that how much aware in terms of our own environment? How many, how many of you travel by tube every day? Most of you, yeah? What do you think about the air quality in the tube? <laughs> Good, bad, worse? You have no idea, I guess. Uh, I have no idea. But every time I took the, uh, I think I, I take the tube. Uh, uh, afterwards, I have uh, uh, when I uh, uh, when I sneeze the nose and so on. What have you, you see some black stuff coming off your nose? So we wonder, okay, how good is the air quality around us? Um, um, and one of the measure, of course, I know. NO is not a, not a measure for tube. Uh, uh, the uh, PM2.5 is probably one of the uh, useful measurements. We can see how polluted in, in such an enclosed environment, maybe even in here. Uh, I don't know the air quality in here. I think it's good, right? Well, we don't know. Um, so what we did is uh, one of, one of my, my master students uh, spent a summer working on building, can we build something small, wearable, uh, to monitor the air quality uh, of the 
immediate surrounding of you, of around us itself. So we put together, although it looks a bit uh, wiring and so on, but it's, uh, it's not exactly wearable, but you can, you can carry around and measure some of the air quality around us. And he did a study. Uh, it was a very small scale study, of course. Only one person traveling, traveling, traveling all around London on the tube. And this is all, this are the, are the some result we got. Um, yeah, you, we, you probably travel on Piccadilly Line. You know that probably is quite poor <laughs> compared to the Jubilee Line. And the interesting thing is also at different time of the day, you have different kind of concentrations or, um, in terms of the PM 2.5. Uh, those peak hours are probably much worse than those, those long peak hours. Uh, and at that time, uh, the uh, Lunar Underground has no kind of measurements. They don't really release any information about how, how the air quality in the underground stations. They only give us a very rough measurement of the whole Lunar Underground. Good, yeah? Because they have overground station, they have underground station, they, they do the average, then you probably get a very good um, air quality. And so he did go around <laughs> London, spent quite a lot of time uh, on the underground, uh, uh, carrying the sensors, measuring, measuring the air quality around a different line, a different time. Uh, obviously, those newer lines, the Julia line, and also those overground lines, the circle lines, are much better compared to the most, uh, those like probably uh, deep underground, the Piccadilly line, and those older lines. Um, and we thought maybe the platform screen door in the uh, Jubilee line, maybe it helps uh, blocking some of the dust coming from off the, uh, the track. Uh, maybe the better ventilation in the new, new stations are better. So this finding was quite, quite interesting. Um, but we don't believe our own sensor. We want to see, okay, is it really true? So last, uh, 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 last year, I, I got a group of students. Uh, we managed to get some funding to buy a ex quite expensive particle counter. So uh, they are very health cautious, want to find out, okay, is Imperial, is Imperial really good quality of air? How about our office? How about the Paddington station? Yeah, their, their lab is next to the uh, station. Uh, how about in the train, on the track? So how's the quality of air? Um, is, it, is it similar to the one, uh, to the finding, to the uh, result we, uh, we found earlier? So this is the result. So it proved that Imperial does have a very good air quality. It shows that in most of the, most of the senior common room, uh, Patterson wing in, over here, uh, the hack space, even the hack space in some of the labs, uh, uh, are pretty good quality of air. The green, the the tube on circle line, uh, the circle line platforms are pretty good. And outside the um, Paddington station is kind of moderate level on the back uh, Bakerloo entrance. Uh, the Paddington railway is moderate. Inside Bakerloo station is okay. Uh, but don't walk near the Paddington smoking area. Seems to be quite dangerous. And even worse <laughs> is the Bakerloo platform uh, on the train or off the, on the platform. So Bakerloo line seems to be in the hazardous range, which is quite alarming. Um, yeah, we are, we are the, it, uh, I know the uh, Mayor of London has been, has been proposing and trying to push the very ambitious program to improve the air quality uh, have a zero emission right in around London, um, and I believe they're also trying to look into the underground nowadays. I think they, they're planning to to spend uh, uh, invest a lot of money to improve this, the air quality in underground. Um, but one thing, but the one important thing is, uh, as I said, at different time of the day, we have different kind of readings, and also it depends on how clouded the area and so on. So uh, the previous speakers talk about the exposure, right? How much you expose those pollutants. Um, so what the aim of our work is potentially, can we make something smaller and smaller and, and you can carry maybe even tech uh, with your phone so you know roughly 
what are the air quality around you. And also, if more people have this kind of sensors, then have much, much uh, better details, much denser information. So not only rely on those radar station or air, uh, air quality station, we can have our own network. People become the sensors. So we started with that uh, sensors, and we tried to make our sensor to be smaller. Uh, this is the attempt. It's still quite big. It's still a <laughs> box, but uh, it's our own own design uh, of the sensor. And we tested with the off-the-shelf particle counter. Uh, it's, although it's not linear, but it, it does have a has quite quite high uh, our value. Um, eventually, we want to make it to be as small as yeah five p. Uh, we believe it is possible, uh, but we haven't done it yet. <laughs> That's something something which we are aiming to do. So ideally, is everyone can carry a sensor around, and then all the data can beam to the server somewhere. Then then maybe when you when you try to plan your trip load up your Google map, and then you can see, OK, maybe I should take this route rather than the other route. Maybe I should take circle line rather than the Piccadilly line. Um, and especially for those people who have uh, lung diseases or have uh, uh, <coughs> allergic to dust and so on. So this is uh, some of our, of course, some of our preliminary work. I need to, I'd like to thank all my students and our collaborators. And they did a fantastic work and spent quite a lot of time <laughs> in the fair blue that run the underground. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very good, thanks. So, a 5P sensor. Is it going to cost 5P as well? <laughs> 5P. We hope so. We do hope that it could cost 5P. Uh, it's feasible if we have made enough of them, so but then, not there yet. <laughs> so the epidemiologists were very interested. Yeah. So, any questions? Yes. Very interesting. Um, this is just a general sort of question. When your students and your team came yeah. back and, and you put the data together, hmm. did they ever talk about their own feelings? Because there are, I think people have very different um, feelings about how they feel on the underground. So some people are aware of differences hmm. and others aren't. Yes, indeed. I mean, because uh, of course, uh, our students already know that. Uh, when, we, when we talk about that, they, oh yeah, they, they realize that because they all travel uh, uh, through the underground every day. They, they, they realize that. And but we have the same question. We don't know how, how bad it is, and they want to find out themselves. I mean, they are scientists, they are engineers. <laughs> they want to go and find out, uh, and which, 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 uh, we managed to get a quite, quite interesting, interesting result we got. Um, but of course, uh, at the moment, we have no other choices. We still have to travel by two, most of us. Uh, but we hope that uh, more and more this kind of devices, technologies, and data results can help uh, pushing the governments or to, to, to get things done much quicker. Well, what yeah. I can't, just to, to fill it out a bit, mm. what I can't quite grasp with anything that we've heard yet is how that re relates to physiology mm. and, uh, and how people are actually feeling. Yes. Uh, uh, whereas when you're in a room mm. full of cigarette smoke, you're, you're very aware. Mm. And I think that the, the big difference here is perception. Mm. Yeah, perception and physiology. Of course, physiology will take some time before we find out mm. um, the result, of course. Uh, and the and the perception itself, um, we haven't done that. To be honest, we haven't done the perception to ask everyone. Okay, what do they feel? Um, that is something which uh, probably not our expertise. We are engineers. We more look at measurements and and results. And yes, it, it will be quite interesting to see how they perceive the information uh, in terms of how they perceive the environments, uh, the pollution, uh, and the traveling by tube. And uh, this is something which, uh, of course, it will be quite quite interesting. I, mean, I think one of the, the issues is uh, what you're saying is true. So the nice bright days that we get with these big cyclones, actually the air pollution is sky high. Most people think that those are nice clear days because they look clear. Um, and, and so people are not really aware of what you're, what you're measuring. Um, another question really about what you're measuring. So you're measuring what? PM 2.5. So it's as what? 
micrograms or yeah, um, micro per meter, per microgram per oh. meter square. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And anything else on the? No, no. We only uh, at this point we only focus on the PM two point five. Right. Any other questions? We can come back to these things later. But Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mill. Have you seen any of the uh, attempts by some of the commercial operators of um, air pollution monitoring to actually put wearable devices onto uh, consumers? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I haven't come across this as yet. So there is one called mm. Plume. It's a French outfit. Mm. Uh, they have a, a device that's uh, currently uh, going through beta testing. Mm. Nice. Uh, and so your uh, aim to have a wearable device out there is hopefully coming later on this summer. Great. Fantastic. Great. Okay. So maybe we'd go on to the last uh, talk before the general discussion. Um, and this is Yes. So we'll shift into the, um, can you hear me okay? To the biological impacts. Um. Okay. Um, and thank you for the previous speakers for some of the introductions. Um, now we're familiar with a lot of air pollution exposure, ways to measure it, and um, now I'm, we're going to talk about um, omics in a cohort or study called exposomics. Um, and I'm a MRC PhD early career research fellow uh, just across the street in the epidemiology department. Um, any, has anyone heard of the exposome? Okay, good. Yeah, great. Um, so it's getting around. Um, so uh, the work of the exposomics project falls under the exposome paradigm which has broad aims to characterize the totality of exposures from conception onwards. So this seems like a, a really, really large, ambitious goal. Um, and Chris Wilde has been uh, accredited with coming up with this concept. And the idea is that this would then, we can uh, refine our exposure assessments. Uh, you can take a life course approach <coughs> to the relationship between exposures and disease responses. Uh, so you measure things prenatally, early uh, life into adults, and later in life. Um, we can implement multiple study designs, uh, particularly in epidemiology, and uh, multi-level analyses. So we can look at uh, nested cohorts um, and smaller populations versus larger populations. We can improve hazard and risk estimates, identify multi-omics, and pathway perturbations is one of the main focuses of the exposome, and strengthen our causal inferences, um, which then develop better predictive uh, biomarkers. So the exposome includes uh, two domains called the external and internal. So the external can be thought of uh, things that you're exposed to externally. So um, pollution, uh, which is what I'll be focusing my talk on, but we can think of diet, prescriptions, lifestyle factors, uh, stress, um, infections, uh, anything sort of outside of the genotype. And then the internal uh, environment is thought of biomarkers or what you are exposed to on an internal level. So this could be the way that you actually metabolize a contaminant. Um, and in particular focus of the internal exposome is the um, use of biomarkers and samples, such as blood and urine, uh, including omics, which may act as intermediates on the causal path between exposure and disease. So what I mean by omics are uh, things such as the genome, or your individual genotype, but also things that will modify gene expression. And this includes uh, epigenetic modifications such as histone modification, microRNA, and CPG methylation, um, as well as we can measure protein expression and metabolomics. And the protein and metabolomics are thought to be closer to the phenotype um, uh, from exposures. 
So the Economics Project, which I'm going to highlight some findings from today, uh, is a European Union-funded project, and we aimed to develop a novel approach to the assessment of exposure to high-priority environmental pollutants, uh, characterizing both the external and the internal exosome. So we mainly wanted to develop new approaches to assess environmental exposures and uh, characterize the exosome during critical time periods throughout the life. We used multi-omic uh, analyses, so we wanted to link exposures to biochemical and molecular changes. So we measured things such as adiptomics, proteomics, trans transcriptomics, metabolomics, and epigenomics for around 2,000 to 3,000 samples. The main exposures were air and water contaminants, but we're currently expanding this project to look at other uh, exposures. And um, they were during critical uh, life periods. And today I'm just going to talk about a little bit of the air contamination. So here's a, just a, a very large table with a lot of information, but just to show that we have uh, 13 studies uh, representing different study designs, uh, including nested prospective cohorts of mother and child cohorts, um, mid-adult and adult and later in life. And we use experimental studies as well as um, nested uh, disease-free and case control. And we had a panel study um, of adult participants where they volunteered. Uh, we have air pollution measurements um, across uh, the various studies, and some of them overlap. And then we have omics measured um, for multiple studies, with the metabolome being measured across all studies. So for uh, exposure assessment, the aim were to address current research gaps. So we, we know from previous talks and, and just our general knowledge of air pollution, it's a complete, uh, complex mixture, and there are particles of different sizes and composition that are likely to have different toxic effects. Most of the current evidence about health effects of air pollution uh, is based on particular mass and the measure as a measure of exposure. Um, so we measured in exosomics um, common air pollutants such as PM2.5, PM10, NO2, NOx, and black carbon. And then we also looked at less studied um, pollutants such as ultrafine particulates and also oxidative potential, which um, uh, ultrafine um, par particles are rarely studied because of the difficulty in exposure assessment and um, oxidative potential might reflect uh, toxicity. So to measure these, we looked at uh, a macro level assessment, which you heard about um, previously, where you can use land use regression models. Um, so we did some hybrid land use regression models based off of the escaped and air-based data that's currently um, uh, European-wide. Uh, we also measured, like I said, oxidative potential and ultrafine uh, particulate matter using these land use regression models. Uh, on a micro level, we used personal uh, exposure monitoring assessments. So we measured our personal air pollutant of PM2.5 and UFP uh, using monitors of, of, of indoor and outdoor of participants' homes. And we used uh, smartphone data um, to combine methods, uh, various methods of sensors. So some results from some of our, the new LUR models, um, and this is work on, uh, to your left done by uh, John Gulliver um, across the, the, the hall here. Um, so they developed LUR, model, LUR models for oxidative potential where basically they explained um, the spatial variability of oxidative potential of measured PM2.5 uh, using um, uh, two measurements of oxidative potential of AA and GSH. Uh, so they developed the first uh, LUR model for OPAA and um, had great good ag agreeability for this model. And then they developed the second model for um, oxidative potential for uh, glutathione. Um, and if you'd like to know more about uh, the, the development of these models, I definitely recommend reading this uh, paper. Um, and then secondly, we, measured, we developed models for um, UFP. So we wanted to compare the um, short-term model, short -term modeling, sh short-term exposure assessments with long-term modeling, um, and the results highlight that we had some agreements. So it, w it wasn't perfect, of course, but that um, around 50% of the spatial variance could be explained between um, the, the two different measurements, suggesting that um, the models could be used with some degree of error. But um, Secondly, we wanted to uh, assess exposures to air pollution using personal exposure monitoring. So this is where 
Uh, at four different sites, we had volunteers wear backpacks and they had uh, sensors. So we collected repeat 24-hour personal ambient exposure of PM2.5 um, and PM2.5 absorbance, which was a proxy for black carbon and soot. Um, and then we measured ultrafine particles using uh, also the sensors in the backpacks. So we wanted to then estimate the agreements between the models of exposure. So we wanted to look at how well do, do these correspond to backpack measurements to LUR models and also the smartphone data. As you heard previously, we can incorporate things such as uh, movement um, as, and, and physical activity. Um, we did this at multiple time points and we had omics after uh, two exposure assessments. So we collected blood and urine samples and then um, uh, measured the omics in, in these samples. Uh, we also have detailed covariate data um, that we are now analyzing as potential mediators and modifiers of this relationship. So all participants uh, filled out detailed dietary information um, so, and health assessment question questionnaires as well as um, spy, spy, spy my So just uh, some results from the, the Penn studies that I just mentioned. Different microenvironments contributed to ultra-fine uh, particulate. Um, so, as you can see uh, on the x-axis, these are different environments such as participants' home, work, outdoor, and travel. And then um, basically what we're showing are, are different measurements of UFP. But the take-home message is that actually the, the highest exposure occurred in participants' home. So this is suggesting that uh, it's probably from cooking. So cooking has been shown to be a, um, a large exposure for UFP uh, source. Um, so now to look a little bit into um, the omics data, so uh, this provides some insight into which biological pathways are affected by the air pollution. So for the PIN study, I'm just uh, highlighting the uh, metabolomic results. What we see is that the metabolomic signatures differ depending on the components of the air pollution. Uh, so if we measure PM2.5 uh, versus personal exposure, we see a little bit of overlap, as you can see, uh, between the, the green circle and the blue circle. Um, but overall, uh, if you look in the middle, we're not seeing a lot of metabolites that are similar based on exposure, suggesting that um, the different components of air pollution have different biological um, uh, endpoints or, measure, or impacts on metabolomics. Um, next, I'll talk to you briefly about um, some of our life course approach of early life. So we wanted to look at the relationship between omics and air pollution in mother-child cohorts. Um, so we measured PM 2.5, 10, UFP, and NO2 um, in four uh, mother-child uh, uh, pairs uh, in, um, across Europe. And what the graph is displaying is that across the cohorts, we had differences in exposure to PM2.5 and 10, UFP and NO2, um, depending on the area where the cohorts were. When we look at some of the omic profiles, so if you look at the um, figure on the left, this is uh, showing the difference between the metabolome between higher exposure, uh, which is the figure on the top, and the lowest exposure cohort, which is the figure on the bottom. So we can see that uh, the metabolomics profiles differed by exposure which may suggest a thresholding effect or a dose-response effect. So this does make pulling the samples a little bit more difficult. Um, however, we are also are working on pulling the samples now. And then the figure on the right I'm um, showing, uh, this is the uh, Manhattan plot of significant um, uh, methylation data and transcription data, as well as targeted proteins that are based on inflammation and metabolites. We see very few uh, hits for significant um, features across the different omic measurements. Um, however, what we're working on now, because we know that there's crosstalk between these, these, the different omics um, and they're associated with one another, is that when we look at the cross-omics analysis, we can see that um, there are correlations. So on this, this plot here, we can see we have the different omic measurements. Um, and we see some, the strongest association with air pollution when we look at uh, cross omics, uh, which suggests that there may be a, a similar pathway or a, a, a biological signal that we could be picking up on, on these um, participants. Um, 
Next, I'll talk to you about the results from Oxford Street and Hyde Park crossover studies. And many of you may have heard of this study before, where participants walked uh, along Oxford Street, which we heard how heavily polluted it is. Um, and then they also walked in Hyde Park. So we wanted to measure uh, the um, exposure to air pollution at these sites, and then look at the uh, impact of this on um, some of their omic biomarkers. Um, so we saw the strongest um, association between uh, exposure to NO2 and metabolomics, um, where we got uh, hits for um, caffeine as well as carnitine. So carnitine has been previously associated with air pollution, so this was um, an interesting finding there. Um, and then putting some of these data together, uh, because basically we want to know, are there are there biomarkers that are representative of, of um, certain pollutants across uh, multiple studies? Well, what we found is that um, it depends on the exposure. So if you look at the Oxford Street study, here's the metabolome, and I'm showing the overlap between metabolites um, given the exposures to carbon, um, black carbon, PM10, PM2.5, and NO2. And we can see that there's very, very little overlap, suggesting that there are exposure-specific uh, markers um, in the metabolome. We see this as well with this transcriptome and in a different cohort. So some other approaches um, that we're looking into to uh, address biological pathways include um, adictomics, which is a very new technology um, uh, that's um, suggested to increase sensitivity and specificity in identifying red, relative chemicals and mixtures. Um, so a lot of uh, the, the problem with using metabolomics is that we may see signals, but we don't necessarily know what, it, what they are yet. Um, so adictomics is the new technology that's promoted to, um, to, to possibly identify um, some of these unidentified um, molecules, as well as um, better addressing low-dose um, and dose response effects. So we have currently measured adictomics in, in a few of the studies. Um, but those data are not ready yet, so stay tuned. Um, and um, another area that we're working on that uh, I'm particularly working on as well is how, how does all this relate to causality? So as an epidemiologist, how, how well can we say, okay, this exposure is causing this um, molecular response, which is then related to a disease? So one approach put forth by our statistician is the meet-in-the-middle approach where we look at the relationship between the exposure to the biomarker, um, the biomarker to the intermediate, and then we look backwards from the disease to the intermediate. Um, so they, a recent paper, that's, well, it's in press, it'll be published very soon, um, supported this meet in the middle hypothesis where we looked at exposure to air pollution and risk of coronary heart disease. And we found that there were um, inflammatory proteins um, that were associated with both exposure and disease as well as um, uh, inflammatory pathways um, of DNA, from DNA methylation. Uh, the next step in this is what I'm working on now, is that I'm using a, a causal inference, so where you model the counterfactual. So this is a t statistical technique where I hypothetically change exposure within the same individual, so if they were exposed or unexposed, this is then alter, alter the um, methylation um, or uh, uh, inflammatory proteomic response, um, and how does this uh, then change the risk of disease? And with that, I'd like to thank um, the funders, which obviously are the European Union, and my um, funding through the MRCP Cheese Center. And this is just uh, some collaborators for the current analyses that I presented today, but. Obviously, this is a huge undertaking, um, and there are lots of people to thank. So. Paper for before we start the general discussion. Any questions on this particular paper? Yeah. You said that in the PM sessions, you got the urine blood samples. Do you remember whether the signals between the two were the same regarding the air pollution? Um, for so the signals we found between biomarkers in blood 
Mm -hmm. Where did they say in urine? Oh, right. Um, so a lot of the biomarkers, for example, we would measure metabolomics in the urine, but then we wouldn't have that in necessarily the blood. So the biomarkers might be more specific to the uh, omic signature than the, the pollution signature. So um, we haven't necessarily compared um, whether uh, the biomarker to blood and urine are similar or not. Um, so most of the urine was used for the metabolomics, and then the blood would be used for its DNA methylation. So unfortunately, I can't answer that question. But studies that have uh, seen, looked at whether, uh, well, that would be different biological tissue markers would be specific for DNA methylation. Um, but we didn't look at that. One of the acts of faith that um, underlies quite a lot of the impact assessments for air pollution and gives us, multiply this number by that number, get a very large number for what the problem is, is the assumption that all particles have the same toxic effect. Mm -hmm. That seems to be completely against that. Right. So you yeah. think that's not likely to be true. We should be a bit careful about just assuming a particle is t toxic by itself. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a, they seem to be um, signature specific, so um, I mean, it, it's a, it, I think it'd be wrong to just group all air pollution as, as a category based on these data. I think maybe one of the other things that worries some people is that you seem to have an almost infinite number of variables mm. and quite a relatively small number of people. Mm -hmm. involved in these studies, does that cause a problem? Um, I mean, you always have a problem with that with the, all, the big data uh, <laughs> uh, goal, um, but we, we use sensitive statistical techniques to try to uh, address this, including multiple correction testing and um, trying to do uh, most of its data reduction. Um, so we're trying to reduce the amount of omics to um, what are important using, say, PCA, principal component analyses or factor analyses, pulling out um, those, yeah. Okay. yeah. Questions on this specific talk? If not, if I could ask the speakers to come down, we'll have a discussion Um, so, have a seat. So, maybe I could start people off. Um, so, one of the things I think that's uh, come out of this for me is that we have a bit more of a problem than we thought we had in deciding um, what should be the target because Everybody, I suspect, in this room, having arrived with the title of this talk, will think that um, air pollution is the great enemy. And therefore, anything you can do to, to reduce um, exposures will be a really good thing. Um, and it seems to me that there's actually some ambiguity about that, that there's a cost to doing that in terms of the amount of exercise people get, the amount of mobility that they have. And certainly, I think some of Audrey's estimates maybe from Barcelona, were actually that the, that the benefits of increasing exercise seem to rather outweigh um, the problems um, associated with um, reducing air pollution. So maybe we could get some views on that. Yes, yes. Um yeah, one of the, the questions that we get a lot is, well, after showing that cyclists and active travelers are being more exposed and they're inhaling more and their inhale doses are higher, should I stop cycling? And it's important to make the message clear that, of course not, that um, as, as far as we've, we've um, seen, the, 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 the benefits of physical activity clearly outweigh 
the the costs of doing so in a polluted city. So there's clearly huge, huge, huge benefits from doing physical activity. Um, after saying that in a in 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 a con in a room like this one, someone said, "Then why are we caring about air pollution? We should all just." Forget about air pollution. Let's talk about physical activity and let's all improve our physical physical activity. Of course, um, a, an interesting an interesting result from the re from the research that you were mentioning from Audrey is how uh, in some cities uh, after maybe half an hour to an hour of doing exercise outdoors, um, the benefits that you are receiving for every minute additional minute that you do a physical activity. You stop receiving those additional benefits because of air pollution. So the air pollution is definitely a, an issue, and it's an issue that is affecting um, active travelers more than passive travelers. And then that's like the unbalance I was mentioning, right? You have you you have uh, Andrea doing this interesting research on how if even if we have electric vehicles, the the, the emissions that don't come from the exhaust have higher concentrations. So you have cyclists with l no emissions, no exhaust emissions, and um, well, some resuspended particles maybe, but something ne negligible next to a car. And they are the ones that are getting the worst deal in, in, in concentration. So, so yeah, let's still keep cycling, but let's make cycling um, safer and, 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 and um, yeah, protect the, the cyclists and the pedestrians and the active travelers. No, I, I completely agree. I, um, I think Audrey has this very interesting paper where uh, she measures like how the ben the health benefits of cycling even in an extremely polluted city in Asia. And as Juan Pablo was saying, uh, the health benefits out outweigh the their pollution concentrations. Just 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 to add a little bit there on that research from from Audrey and and. Uh, James Woodcock, right, was also in that in that research. Just to mention that the data that they use, because of lack of data that we're collecting, uh, is associated to to networks, right? So this is not like personal monitoring uh, data that they're using to to come to this conclusion. So still a very very interesting but a, a result and and very clear on the different levels that we're talking about. But still more data is needed. And like you mentioned, the Oxford Street being the most polluted place that we've sent in NO2 that, of course, turns on the alarms in terms of Oxford Street, but also turns on the alarms that, well, we haven't measured as much as we would like to, because I'm sure that there are more polluted areas than Oxford Street. Um, surely, if cycling is so bad for you, wouldn't you say choose a different mode of transport and then still continue doing physical activity in another way? Wouldn't that make more sense than continuing to cycle? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yes, the, uh, another option is why don't we promote physical activity and not as a, uh, as, a, as a mode of transport, but why don't we promote physical activity in a gym or whatever, um, which is also one option. Um, sedentarism in the entire world is a big issue and make people normally argue that they don't have enough time for physical activity so active travelers are um, a great way of solving that issue so that's one of the reasons why you would promote cycling and walking because if you don't have time for anything else at least you're going to spend time traveling so why not use use more sustainable modes um, at the same time as from the boxes that I showed but I didn't get into that detail but Active travelers, in general, just move more. So you, people that do cycle normally also go to the gym and also. So the, the uh, physical activity, it's not either or. It's just let's promote physical activity as, as much as we can. If we were all cyclists, we wouldn't have an air pollution, <laughs> such a, a big air pollution issue. So um, that's also one of the arguments. Why don't we just cycle and reduce emissions just by using a, a more sustainable um, thing a exposure to green space is another thing. So mental health and physical health associated to exposure to green space um, you wouldn't get from doing it in in a gym. Um, and finally, is again, it's just like this unfairness of saying you are doing the good for the environment and still you're not receiving the benefits. 
versus yes, let, let let's all drive cars and forget about it. And this is it starts to sound like a, a what's the name of that little robot thing that nobody moves and then you know. So that's that's not the the sustainable city that you would imagine in the future. Um, and I'll just comment on that. Um, I think that looking at good and bad just by the exposure data. Um, so if a cyclist is more exposed and and breathing in, um, which are, is very interesting, um, we don't necessarily know from the data presented here, what we've discussed, how this influences health. So if we have increased risk for, say, cardiovascular disease or asthma or these health, adverse health outcomes, even mortality from air pollution exposure, does cycling um, mitigate that? Um, and what are the biological impacts and the um, pharmacokinetic type models that we can look at um, based on exposure um, increases in, so let's say that exposure increases oxidative stress, but then you get increases in um, the good biological pathways from cycling. We don't, we don't know quite yet what that means on a biological level and, a, and, and in terms of the relationship between exposure and disease risks. Um, so I think that that's one way to move forward with this um, other than, as we've all said, other than just looking at the exposure data. Um. Okay, um, thank you for the, sorry, thank you for the uh, talks, they're very interesting. I've got a question for Andrea. So you modeled uh, a 10 to 50 percent reduction on cars and if people were to stop stop using them. Have you considered or have you monitored or modeled uh, the effect of how people be, would be exposed to air pollution if they were to use transport instead of these, instead of using cars as vehicles for transport? So if they will move to public transport yeah. instead well, how, of active would, travel? Yeah, how would the air pollution intake or how would they be affected by it? Would it increase or decrease? Or Yeah, so I, I measure more health benefits. So uh, I think Juan Pablo is more on the exposure side. But within my, my scenarios, uh, I do send some trips to the public transport. So it's not all uh, changed to, to walking and cycling because you have to, to analyze the distance of the trips and many, dis m many trips that take uh, a long distance cannot be done by cycling or walking. So people will, st will still need to move in public transport. Okay, uh, did you have, did, Juan, did you have anything to add to, to that in terms of how you feel it might affect people? Would, do you think people would f uh, be more exposed to pollution if they were to move to public transport or do you feel that they'd be less, less exposed if they were to continue using their own personalized vehicles? So um, public transport is many times considered also as active transport, right? Because you have to walk to your station and then walk from the station to your place. So that's part of the benefits that you would have there. And cyclists, pedestrians and people that use buses are less exposed than people that use cars. But didn't the data show that cyclists were more, or they had higher they are less knocks? Normally they are less exposed, but they inhale mo more, inhale. which is yeah. like the entire discussion, yes. Uh, but in terms of the exposure to air pollutants, they would, they would be marginally less, or well, not even marginally, but they would be less exposed in terms of their concentrations in, in many cities. That will depend also. Like the, the, as when you look at the data from Barcelona, Antwerp, and London, the three cities behave differently. Um, and then you have the question about the underground. So if you're going to have constant lower concentrations of which pollutant and what do you mean by public transport? Is it is it bus, or is it um, or is it a cab, which you would also consider as public transport? But of course, the concentration inside a cab is much higher because not, I mean it's it's an old diesel engine. And then you look into the underground, and it's a very, very difficult way of... Uh, the underground is it's a very complex problem, because in the underground you have a bunch of iron being resuspended that you would read in the PM2.5 monitors, because they're still particles. You would read it also in the black carbon monitors, because the black carbon monitors are light scattering devices that will confuse carbon for iron. But then you have the question that you were making earlier. So is iron particles better, worse, or the same as having carbon particles? So the underground is a particular, uh, which in 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 London it's going it's going to be a very important part of the discussion. So, 
for that part of, of the answer, we would have to wait. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a fair point. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Thank you for the lecture. It's very interesting. What I want to think about is water, water sports and transport in the waterways. Does anybody actually do a research on the pollution? Is it less when one deal with those, those, that area than on land? Does it make sense? You know, when, when I do a lot of kayaking, it's good for my lungs because I'm asthmatic. Uh, I, think, I think I breathe in less pollutants. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Uh, but I get the impression because I am near the water. I'm in the water all the time. Uh, does anybody do a study on that? No? I, I... <laughs> Just not to say no and... <laughs> Move to the next question, but um, two things that we could that we, we could have in mind there is the first one is unfortunately we don't have data on any water sports because our devices are not water resistant. Yeah. <laughs> so people need we explicitly told them take them off if you're going to do any water sports. So that's that's part of our limitations. But the second thing is uh, uh, something that we do know in in air pollution modeling, and it's the distance from the source, right? So while you're kayaking, unless you have a huge diesel boat right next to you. You are not in the. That's one of the reasons why you would think that um, people that are using vehicles would have lower concentrations of pollutants because hey, higher concentrations in pollutants because they're right in the middle of the street where all the sources are. So you're right in that middle. So when you move from 100 or 200 meters away from us from from a street, you see a huge drop in concentrations. So so if you're if you're more than 200 meters away from from a lot of sources. You, your concentrations are going to be much, much, much lower, um, and and in that sense, I think that doing kayak, you are you're safe. Thank you. What about the river boats here? Yeah, I was just I was going to comment. Yeah, it's, there would be other uh, sources of pollution on the water that you might want to consider, and uh, other variables that influence um, the concentration of pollution, such as temperature and humidity, and uh, that it would have be very very different in water situations. Uh, so, I personally don't know, but I think that the there are other variables to consider that would be different than exposure uh, on land. Um. Hi, excuse me. Thanks for the talk. Um, I had a question about data collection, so specifically for yourself. Can you give us an idea roughly how much do these meters cost now? How much are you trying to get them down to? Um, how at many? The, moment, uh, the one we, the, the one, the cheapest one we find is about a thousand pound. Yeah, it's uh, big and noisy as well. It is a big fan in there, and we do hope eventually maybe five p. Uh, but probably it will take us a while before we reach there. Um, and. Back to the previous point about water, yeah, water sport. Maybe there's something we, which we should consider, make it waterproof, and also my student would be very happy probably to collect data better than the land on the ground. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I'm Virginia Murray. I'm from Public Health England. I felt I had to come and listen today. So thank you very much for some excellent presentations. Um, Benny, I sat on the Committee on the Medical Effects of Air Pollutants, and we did talk about air pollutants in the underground. Uh, so there's, there is some record data and some information you could be able to access there, because the real problem with the underground is that you have this shunting of air mm. and the flow through the underground, which is so very complicated to mm. analyse, although it was very useful to have done that when we had London bombings. We knew what the issues were and how we could reopen the underground. Uh, to me, I'm very interested, though, in your omics. The exposure omics, I think, is a really fascinating approach. How, it's obviously funded by the European community, but are you working with other countries around the world on this? Is it just an issue that's happening within Europe, or is it more widely discussed? Uh, thank you. Um, it is widely discussed, and there are um, consortiums in the U.S., so I worked on it previously in the U.S. Um, 
And uh, we have another project where we're a pan-European project looking at, um, we look at social factors, and it's called Life Pass. We look at social factors and biological intermediates, but um, we're also now including uh, seven studies that have air pollution data. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's being addressed from uh, multiple parts of the world, which is good. Um, and we're improving our um, biomarker assessment and data analyses uh, constantly. So I think uh, we're definitely moving into the, the direction to know more. Um, what's going to be important is then the relationship to at a pathway level and um, identifying how these actually uh, relate to disease outcomes. So. so just to pick up on another paradox, it seems to me, in the literature is that um, we've talked almost entirely about particles. Um, the paradox is that in the toxicology, um, particles, very easy to pigeonhole, we know what they do, I mean, we know what some of them do, um, and it's very clear. NO2, the toxicology seems to me to be almost negligible, and yet the epidemiologists always come up with NO2 as being a much better predictor um, of ill effects um, than particles. Uh, so. Can you throw any light on that? And do you think exposomics might um, cast some light on that? No, that's a, a really good question. Um, and it it has a lot to do with it. NO2 is, is a, always measured very well. Um, it has a nice distribution uh, in many of our studies. Um, and uh, yeah, there, we always, we usually see effects with the NO2. Um, the toxicology, toxicology literature um, I mean, having not, I don't know what model organism specifically that you're referring to. Well, but, um, you can put someone in a room with NO2 at quite high levels, exercise them pretty extensively, but, and absolutely nothing happens. Yeah. So it's sort of in just in broad terms, mm -hmm. is quite difficult to demonstrate an effect, and yet it seems to be very um, uh, a very good trigger, whatever it's measuring. Yeah. I mean, it may not be NO2. It, but exactly. Yeah, we may be picking up on other other yeah. particles with NO2. It could Maybe. be a good proxy yeah. to something else in the in the. But it's a very consistent process. finding, and it's which is not true for for particles. Yeah. So I think with more uh, detailed exposure assessment, we could probably tease that mm -hmm. apart more in our epidemiological studies. Mm -hmm. um. Any other? Yes. I was just wondering uh, what, if you had any ideas as to how transport for England could improve air quality on the older lines, like the Piccadilly line, um, because, I mean, just going down there, you can tell, but <laughs> is there any practical implications or things that they could do to improve that? Yeah, well, well of course, I'm, I'm not working for an underground, and, and, and I, I, that's very complicated, probably it's a very complicated problem itself, it's a very aging, aging line, particular line, and the, uh, uh, what we find probably, because compared to the newer line, the Jubilee line, what we see, what we can see is that they have platform screen door, which could block some of the dust, and also better ventilation probably will help in terms of improving the overall environment in those lines. But installing those maybe uh, could be very expensive and also uh, quite time, quite take quite a long time because uh, the pick line is uh, probably one of the most heavy use line uh, in the, the nanogram. Is there work going on with the new cross rails to make sure they're less polluted? Uh, I would hope so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be on precision medicine, so picking up some of the issues that we're 
hearing about today. So, hope to see many of you. Yeah. And thank you very much for your questions.